PDF and the Congolese Army last week launched the second phase of their operations against the Allied Democratic Forces ADF rebels in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo DRC. This is artillery. Mm. Yeah. This coincided with the International Court of Justice ICJ judgment delivered on Wednesday, which ordered Uganda to pay 325 million US dollars or 1.1 trillion Uganda shillings in compensation to the Democratic Republic of Congo after the neighboring state's army was accused of human rights violations and plunder of mineral wealth during its deployment in the eastern part of the country. The reparations, a medal of the road settlement, were far short of the 11 billion US dollars or 38 trillion Uganda shillings in reparations initially demanded by Kinshasa over a conflict that is believed to have killed hundreds of thousands of people. Uganda must pay compensation under four heads of damage, namely damage to persons, damage to property, damage related to natural resources, and macroeconomic damage. Under each of the first three heads of damage, the DRC makes claims with respect to several forms of damage. In particular, the first head of damage that is, damage to persons, includes the DRC's claims for loss of life, injuries to persons, rape and sexual violence. The court awarded Kinshasa $225 million, an equivalent of 785 billion shillings, for loss of lives, 40 million US dollars, about 139 billion shillings for loss of property, and 60 million dollars, an equivalent of 209 billion Uganda shillings for plunder, looting and exploitation of gold, diamonds and timber during the military occupation. Barely after the judgment, many actors, including opposition Doyan Kiza Besige, said the 325 million US dollars debt should not be transferred to the taxpayer, but individuals who looted the DRC's resources. Uh, individuals are not subject of jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. It's countries that are subject of the jurisdiction of the court. So. It's the government of Uganda, and the government of Uganda has clarified that we will continue talking about the judgment with the DRC government. And I think that's where the opportunity is. The message uh, to be found in violation, actually the merits decision in itself was a problem for us, because we are found to have violated international law, um, and one of the basic norms under international law, which is Article 2, Clause 4 of the UN Charter, which prohibits the use of force. So even without this judgment, this judgment regarding reparations, the finding that we violated that basic uh, and very cardinal piece of international law leaves us as a country in a very bad place. It, it spoils our image, our image internationally, and it will take in, a number of years, I think, for us to recover. 24 years ago, the UPDF was sent to the DRC to treat a festering wound in the heart of Africa, a year after the kleptocratic regime of Mobutu Sese Seko had been ousted. The decision to deploy Ugandan troops was taken by the Army High Command, which was chaired by the Commander-in-Chief, Yoweri Museveni, on the 11th of September 1998. The President, in his view, argued that the deployment would secure Uganda's security interests by denying the Sudanese government an opportunity to destabilize Uganda through the eastern Congo, deny habitation of Uganda's dissidents, such as the ADF in the Congo, and protect Uganda's territorial integrity from invasion by Kabila forces. Critics of the deployment, including opposition lawmakers, argued that the country's army could get entangled into quicksand as fecal alliances may crumble and heroes turn into villains. DRC historically was an expansive shiftdom for a number of outsiders to exploit, from the Atlantic slave traders to the Belgian colonizers to mining multinationals who plundered this territory. Even today, the ghost of Leopold's scorched earth policy still hovers this vast expanse. At the time of Uganda's deployment to the lawless Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, a home of rapacious warlords and the professional cutthroats like Russian arms trafficker Victor Bout, the vast country had turned into a theater of conflict. A month earlier before Uganda army was deployed in DRC, the region was rocked by an unprecedented terror attack when on August 7, 1998, nearly simultaneous bombs blew up in front of the American embassies in Nairobi, Kenya and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. 224 people died in the blasts, including 12 Americans, 
and more than 4,500 people were wounded as Osama bin Laden expanded the frontiers of his global jihad. Osama bin Laden's surrogates and masterminds of the embassy attacks, Saleh Ali Saleh Naban and Fazul Abdullah Mohammed, were now on the run. Amongst the senior army officers who played a key role in the DRC are James Kazini, Nobo Mayombo, Peter Kerim, and Paul Lokech, who are all deceased. Before his death, Lokech, nicknamed the Lion of Mogadishu for his bravado in the face of the enemy, had helped Somali government forces to lay a dragnet, an impromptu roadblock to Al-Qaeda's point man in the region with a $5 million bounty, Fazul Abdulham Mohammed. The other officers who participated in the DRC conflict included General Salim Saleh, General Katumba Wamala, who escaped with serious injuries when assassins targeted him last year, Kahinda Otafire, who is the Internal Affairs Minister, Kale Kaihura, the former IGP, who has since been sanctioned by the United States, David Pulkol, the former external spy chief, amongst others. What started as a mission to flush out ragtag groups opposed to the regime in Kampala would later turn into a full-blown conflict referred to as Africa's First World War after it sucked in nine countries and subsequently triggered back-to-back -back inquiries. In 2002, the UN panel of experts released its final report into the plunder of DRC minerals and named a number of Ugandan army officers and warlords to be involved in a tangled web meant to ostensibly loot Congo's mineral wealth, engage in cross-border trade and tax revenues for the purpose of enriching members of the cartel. Unsatisfied by the UN findings, in May 2001, the Kampala regime established the Justice David Porter Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of illegal exploitation of natural resources and other forms of wealth in Congo. The commission's report exonerated President Yorim Seveni, his family, his government, and top military officials of charges levied against them. However, it recommended that some of those found culpable during the inquiry should further be probed. But upon receiving the report, government did not take any action. During Porter's probe, much of the evidence was found to be fabricated, but human rights organizations opined that the Porter Commission of Inquiry was an attempt to whitewash the crimes of those named by the UN report. The Uganda network, according to the UN panel of experts report, allegedly consisted of core group of members including certain high-ranking UPDF officers, private businessmen, and selected Congolese rebel leaders and administrators. The network allegedly conducted activities through front companies such as the Victoria Group, Trinity Investment, La Comer, and Sagrikov. The UN report alleged that the network generated revenue from the export of primary materials from controlling the import of consumables from theft and tax fraud. The UN alleged that this cartel relied on the transnational criminal group led by the Russian arms trafficker Victor Bout. For nearly two decades, Bout grew infamously as the merchant of death. His nickname for the black market weapons deal for which in 2011 he was convicted in a U.S. federal court and sentenced to serve 25 years. Among those who appeared before the inquiry were, now the commander of land forces and the first son, Lieutenant General Mohose Kainerugaba, who was linked to a company ostensibly owned by a Lebanese, his uncle General Salim Saleh, and his wife, Jovia Saleh. The company was dealing in diamond, gold, and coffee beans, according to the UN report. Then, at the rank of lieutenant, Mohozi revealed to the commission that he only traveled to Kinshasa. The first was in 1997, during the regime of Lauren Kabila, when he went to look for a market for meat products on behalf of his family ranch, which is well known for the keeping of cattle and the need for a market. The second occasion was in early 1998, when he had started working for Caleb International, Salim Saleh's firm, for discussions with some potential partners in the Democratic Republic of Congo, with the possibility of developing some mining interests there. This was early in the regime of Laurent Kabila, when friendly relations were thought to exist with Kinshasa, reads part of the Porter Report. The commission concluded that it was fully satisfied that these were genuine visits during peacetime to promote international trade, and this commission cannot understand why they appear as criticisms in the original panel report.
Though it cleared him on a raft of allegations, the Porter Commission of Inquiry found General Salim Saleh culpable of committing offences under Section 396 of the Companies Act when he falsely stated that his son, Alexander Mohota, was an adult businessman in the returns he filed with the Registrar of Companies when he knew he was a minor. The Commission observed that although General Saleh later disposed of his shares, he did so amidst a welter of backdated paperwork to his wife in a company where the only other shareholder was his infant son. This commission has no doubt that he wished to give the appearance of disposing of his interest while in fact keeping control of the company. And indeed, Jovia, wife to Saleh, in her evidence, admitted that Salim Saleh kept an active interest. The report revealed that in 1998, Tech Air, in which General Salim Saleh was a shareholder and director, submitted invoices to the UPDF and was paid 111 million shillings for flights to the Congo that could not be identified. General Saleh could not explain the reason for the payment. He promised to check with his staff and report back to the commission. This was not done. Months later, the general appeared before the commission again. When asked about the documents he had promised, including manifests, he said that he had so far failed to get them. Tech Air had closed in late 1998, and he, Saleh, had difficulties in tracing its managing director, who left Uganda in March 1999. To date, the payment is still not accounted for. Further investigations are necessary and recommended, reads the commission report. Jovia Saleh told the commission that she has never been to any part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Salim Saleh denied business dealings with any of the 20 persons mentioned. She and her husband refuted the allegation that she was at the root of the Kisangani Wars. However, this commission has evidence connecting Jovia with Khalil and Victoria in diamond smuggling, which is considered at paragraph 2135 below where this commission has found that it is unable to rule out the participation of Jovia Akandanaho in the diamond smuggling operations of Victoria, revealing that there is some truth in the allegations made against her by the original panel, the report notes. The late Kazini was accused of being the third key actor. It was alleged that he was the master in the field, the orchestra, organizer, and the manager of most illegal activities, and was close to warlords Nyamwisi, Tibasima, Lumbala, Jean Pierre Bemba, all of whom facilitated his illegal dealings in diamond, coltan, and timber, counterfeit currency, and imports of goods and merchandise in Equator and Oriental provinces. Throughout this report, General Kazini's name surfaces in respect of many allegations which relate to the misbehavior of senior officers of the UPDF in the DRC, in respect of which he has taken little action, he has lied to this commission on many occasions. While this commission bears in mind that he was the man on the ground and that many allegations have been freely made from the DRC which have not stood up to close examination, nevertheless, this commission has found that many of those made against General Kazini are supportable, reads the report. Otafiri appeared before the inquiry in regard to two cars, a Mercedes-Benz salon car and a Jeep Cherokee, alleged to have been imported from the DRC. The commission concluded that the explanation given by Colonel Otafire of an allegation contained only in a newspaper report was consistent with his duties at the time of his role as Director General External Security Organization and the commission would not recommend taking the matter further. The DR Congo sued Uganda at the Hague Best Court in 1999 over acts of armed aggression that violated the United Nations Charter and the Charter of the Organization of African Unity, the predecessor of the African Union. Uganda eventually lost the case in 2005 when its legal team erred when they submitted to the court as its evidence a report of a commission of inquiry chaired by the Justice David Porter. During hearing of the case, Uganda made counterclaim that Diara Congo forces ransacked Uganda's embassy in Kinshasa during the war and maltreated Ugandans in violation of the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Kampala later waived this counterclaim. Uganda's permanent representative to the UN, Adonia Ayebare, told NTV while they welcomed the world's court judgment, they protest its inference of wrongdoing by the Ugandan military. That's what 
Uganda government objects to wrongdoing. Wrongdoing always has a context. The context was that there was a large-scale conf conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, dealing with seven countries that have had different interests, dealing with over 30 armed groups. So how do you apportion wrongdoing? You know, that's what we object to. The court sort of assumed that there were two parties. There was the DRC that was wronged and Uganda the aggressor, the sole aggressor. And, and that's what we objected to and that's what we still object to. Ambassador Ayebare said Kampala Kinshasa relations have thawed and they need further dialogue on the $325 million settlement. Our bilateral relation with the DRC uh, is improving. There is nothing we cannot talk about with the current developments. And this judgment will be talked about and, and, uh, and negotiated. But to clear the name is that the wrongdoings that were involved in the original uh, charges before the court have been really reduced. You know, people tend to look at the money. But the money, you remember, the billions now are gone. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the fact is that Uganda was not the only country in Congo. Congo was, you know, there were more than seven countries. There were more armed groups. So whatever happened should have been looked at in that context. But international law don Kabomba Businge said the judgment should offer room for soul searching. It's an important um, message to the actors that um, there's a need to respect international law. And I was seeing, um, uh, for instance, in the most recent conflict now, the ongoing conflict, the actors are very clear that they have sought uh, an invitation in writing from the DRC authorities, which I think is a signal that there are some lessons learned from the initial DRC case. I think that's a very positive development. Um, but, but I think um, it's also a message for the domestic actors that there is a need to hold our, our state accountable. Because this, this judgment in monetary terms has implications for each of our pockets. Judgment offers moral victory for thousands who lost their lives and restores the principles of legality in international human rights law, international humanitarian law and non-interference. There have always been arguments by states that these are political matters, essentially political matters. But the court has been consistent that it's, it's, it's capable of exercising and demarcating the legal aspects of any disputes, dealing with those and leaving the politics um, to other actors. But of course, it's, it's always difficult to see where the politics starts and the law stops. It, many times, international in particular is a deeply political uh, arena. So I think the court has uh, really tried to be sensitive to the implications of its decision both in terms of the need to maintain international peace and security, but also to leave enough room for the parties to continue um, collaborating, which they have to do. Twelve out of the 14 judges on the bench, including Uganda's Julia Sebutinde, ruled against Kampala to pay the reparations for loss of lives and other damage to persons that included rape, conscription of child soldiers, and the displacement of up to 500,000 people. Twelve justices also ruled in favor of 65 million U.S. dollars as a modest payment for Uganda, while all 14 justices unanimously ruled in favor of awarding Kinshasa 60 million U.S. dollars for the mineral wealth plundered by the Ugandan military or rebels they supported. Twelve justices against two rejected Diara Congo's claim that the costs it incurred in the case be borne by Uganda while all 14 rejected other submissions made by Kinshasa. So our lawyers that really urged the case to where we are. But this is not uh, a legal matter. This is also a diplomatic and a political matter with DRC. And again, as I said, with the current administration in Kinshasa, we will talk about it. Where the debate comes about the politics of international law, um, there's, there's issuing a sum that you know the country has little hope or ability to pay uh, whatsoever given its foreign debt obligations already. So I think that might have been a factor. A second one I think is, uh, and this is an extra legal consideration, but I think the court might have had this at the back of their mind, that of the several parties involved in that conflict, only Uganda submitted to the jurisdiction of the court. Rwanda, for instance, um, refused to turn up and under international law, uh, it was its prerogative. So Uganda, in a sense, which turned up then um, bore the full legal uh, culpability for what really were actions of not just one actor but many. So the court, as a, 
as an actor in the political arena might have been concerned about what would have been the effect of an overly um, or unwieldy uh, repression sum in terms of discouraging other courts, uh, other countries which might want to submit to the, its jurisdiction. The money will be paid in annual installments of $65 million dollars or 226 billion Uganda shillings for five years, starting this year on September 1st until 2026, and a 6% interest shall accrue on any installment defaulted. Taxpayers buckle up.